Hi, I'm Jonathan Paul, and welcome to the fourth and final day of the third annual Insight Jam, a week-long social media celebration of enterprise tech hosted by Solutions Review. Today's focus is on business intelligence, and for the next hour we'll have a discussion with six industry experts on data governance in the era of remote work. So let's bring in that esteemed group of panelists now from around the world. A great group. Um, Emma will be moderating. Let me put her in the first slot here. Susan, Michael, Yael, Barr, and Balaji, welcome to the panel. Glad to have you here. Um, I'm going to step out of the way and let you begin with the introduction. So, Emma, uh, please start us off with uh, your name, title, and a little bit of background about yourself. <clears throat> Great, thanks. So I'm Emma McGratton. I'm Senior Vice President for Engineering at Actium. I have celebrated my 29th year at Actium this week, so uh, quite a long time at one company, but in many roles here. Uh, and right now, my, my role is in leading a distributed engineering organization that's focused on delivering a data platform that allows us to connect to, manage, and analyze data. And uh, I'm very excited to learn from my fellow panelists today uh, their thoughts on data governance in the era of remote work. So with that said, I think in alphabetical order, we'll start with you, Balaji. Hi, thanks. Um, thanks, Emma. And thanks for the opportunity to meet all of you and talk to you again. My name is Balaji Ganesan. I'm CEO, co-founder at Privacera. I founded this company in 2016. This is my second startup. Uh, uh, I previously started a company called XA Secure, which was in the big data governance space acquired by another company called Hortonworks. And now uh, uh, the product was open sourced and now known as Apache Ranger. Uh, Privacy is an extension of that. Uh, we help uh, balance what we call as a dual mandate in the enterprise between data, data use, and data governance, but specifically security compliance within. So happy to talk, happy to share my insights around that, but really excited to be here today. Great. Thanks, Balaji. Next up, Bar. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. Uh, my name is Bar. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Monte Carlo. Um, we're named after the simulation, not the location. Um, uh, prior to starting Monte Carlo, I was VP operations, working with lots of organizations, helping them become data driven, whatever that meant. Um, and it was really hard for many reasons, chief among them being able to answer some fundamental questions about the data that led to distrust in data. Um, and it was always fascinating, fascinating to me how engineering teams had all these amazing solutions while data teams were really flying blind when it comes to a lot of the questions around data trust and um, quality of the data. Um, and so started Monte Carlo to help organizations um, become uh, uh, data driven by reducing what we call data downtime. Um, uh, we've uh, raised over $100 million from the same folks who backed um, some amazing data infrastructure companies like Snowflake and Looker and Segment. Um, I'm super passionate about all things data, uh, so really, really stoked about this discussion and, and um, hope, to, hope to, to learn some great insights from the folks around the table here. Great. Thanks, Bar. Uh, Michael, over to you. Hello. My name is Michael Klaus. I'm CEO of Aracama. I'm actually one of the founders of the company, and we are obsessed with uh, automating and unifying, unifying quality and governance in an intelligent way. We build the platform, you know, um, as the we, we could see the the customer needs from simply just data quality. Then we've added catalog along the way. We've added uh, data mastering, and all of it is really in a single uh, single platform that helps people to kind of traverse from one use case to another without even kind of noticing. Uh, they don't have to understand the you know the, the details details of it. Great, thanks, Michael. Now over to you, Susan. Hi, everybody. I'm Susan Cook, CEO of Zaloni, and so honored to be a member of this panel. I feel like I'm breathing some rarefied air with all of these uh, experts. So um, Zaloni is an enterprise data governance, data ops platform. So I think all of us on this call are passionate about data and have spent our whole career in this space. And data is gold. It's, uh, it should be treated like the asset and the product that it is. So just like any other product, it has a supply chain. So think of Zaloni as an end-to-end -end supply chain management software for that data supply chain. So that's what we do. And, uh, and I'm so happy to be here. Thanks, Susan. Now over to you, Yael. Yes. Hello, uh, everyone. I'm Yael. I'm the CEO of Octopi. Um, I'm coming from both uh, the startup and enterprise uh, world. Uh, I spend most of my, my time in the data world, but also security, uh, cybersecurity. 
uh, and trying to bring uh, these two together. Um, I grew in the engineering uh, areas. Uh, I had the, the opportunity to move few uh, large organization from on-prem solution to big data cloud solutions and machine learning. So, and, and also being uh, um, had the opportunity to build a few uh, BI and uh, analytics teams. So I feel that I know the different areas of uh, this domain uh, and the pain of our customers. Uh, Octopi is a leading uh, solution for data lineage and data catalog. Uh, we are doing everything automatically uh, and we help a data team trace their assets, understand their data flows uh, in their organization and trust their data. And I'm also very honored to be here. Great, thanks Yael. So I guess we'll get started with the first question. So uh, you know, when we think about big data, we've always focused on velocity and volume, and now I think venue has become important. So uh, starting with you, Balaji, how do you think the era of remote work has most impacted data governance uh, inside organizations? Yeah, um, I think great question. So, I mean, if you broadly think about the journey of data governance getting prominence in the enterprise, right? What is data governance? It is really uh, understanding data, the data management aspects to it, and truly putting that framework in so that you can analyze data, but also put guardrails on that part. Um, and it is going from being a rule book in companies to actually, uh, you know, really being implemented or across the organization, that framework aspect to it. Uh, at the same time, while this is happening, you know, we are in, you know, part of COVID and other parts are going from physical, being in physical walls to being remote. And, and, and these things are happening around the same time. It is sort of creating this interesting paradigm and friction right now where you could usually small teams could actually be sitting close to each other and talk to each other and get that information out, right? So, hey, do you know about this data? Or, hey, how can I access this data as paths to it? Now, all of a sudden, you're no longer in this physical walls to do that part of it. And as these teams are adopting more and more data use, you don't have those physical connections to go and say, solve simple things. So that those simpler things that used to happen when everybody was in the same room no longer happens in, in a remote world, right? So, and that also applies to broader, you know, compliance and security and guardrails where you could trust each other and you can have a more open culture of sharing data. And what organization now are seeing is like, wait a minute, like you, you just don't know who's sitting where. We have to put more guardrails. We have to be more careful as part of it. So uh, it is happening around the same time. It's creating this interesting paradigm where most forward-looking organizations are really looking at governance upfront and not as an afterthought. And that has accelerated in the midst of COVID, in the midst of COVID, in the midst of remote work as well. So it for us in the industry who have been in the governance space, it's interesting to see that is getting prominence and remote work as of being not in the same space has accelerated those topics. Great. Thanks, Balaji. Bar, you look like you have something to add to that. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, the the world has drastically changed in the last couple of years, right? Nothing that ha that held true or very few things that held true a couple of years are true today, right? Um, the first maybe strongest tr trend that I'm most excited about is actually the elevated importance of data. Um, so data is always important, but in the last couple of years, like you can't argue that, right? If you think about sort of the data industry a couple of years ago, I was just reflecting on this, there were actually not that many acquisitions or exits, um, not that much um, investor money was actually going into the data industry. Um, I know this is old news, but with Snowflake's IPO being the largest IPO of all times from a software perspective, that changed the game, right? Um, and if you look at sort of the importance of data and organizations today, and other sort of strong indicating leaders of that um, uh, uh, signs of that, or if you actually look at those companies, so Snowflake uh, looking at 1.1 billion revenue um, this year, um, Databricks, I believe that are 600 million and accelerating. Um, Google just released that um, their GCP big BigQuery cloud data warehouse. Um, that the year has an end of 1.5 billion revenue, and so all of those um, all of those are leading indicators and strong signals that. Data is more important than ever. Um, and I think a lot of that is because, to Balaji's point, is that in the last couple of years, we've realized that we are you know, sitting in our houses and making a lot of decisions. And the only thing that we can look at to for, at our disposal is actually data. And so we're seeing this explosion 
um, of people turning to that. We're also seeing the rise of data organizations in companies. Um, so data is moving closer to the CEO. We're seeing more and more chief data officers. We're also seeing an interesting trend, data moving closer to engineering, actually. So a lot more engineering leaders now take ownership of data, which I also think speaks to the importance of data becoming more uh, a core part of the product and of company, which, which I think is a very important change. And so actually, with all of that in mind, the definition of data governance has changed completely, in my opinion. Um, I think last couple of years, a lot of folks talked a lot about automation. And I think a couple of years ago, you could sort of like, you know, slide it under the rug if you would like manually look at numbers to make sure they're accurate or like, you know, uh, tap someone on the shoulder to say like, hey, does this check out? Um, and obviously, like, that just doesn't work today. And so I think we actually have to flip data governance on its head and start being a little bit more... Um, specific about what are the problems that we're solving. I'm in particular very excited about um, bringing a lot of concepts from engineering and applying those to data. I think that could help us. We don't have to like reinvent the wheel in many ways. Uh, and so uh, applying those concepts is sort of a, a shortcut, if you will, to, to help our, our lives uh, easier on, on the data side here. Great, thanks. Susan, do you think there's concerns around the security aspect of you know, people? I guess the boundaries for managing data has, has grown, so the boundaries for, for governance is growing uh, with people moving into remote environments because it used to be that I think the traditional access path for data in an organization was probably you know either you were sitting inside the organization or you were in a company laptop with a VPN connection and now people expect to be you know standing by the side of a football field uh, on their cell phones and being able to access that data. Do you think data governance and, and security requirements are changing uh, with the, you know, the, the push out into more remote um, locations uh, with people accessing that data and uh, you know, the concerns around maybe you know, data privacy and in those environments? Uh, heck yes. <laughs> um, I think uh, remote work in COVID has amplified and accelerated everything that Bart just mentioned. And I totally passionately agree with everything she just said. Um, data is a discipline in and of itself. And that that requires and mandate that we learn uh, as we go. And, you know, I'm not going to steal the thunder of of uh, Balaji and uh, Yael, because this is their specialty. But I will tell you as a CEO, every morning, this is the first thing I look at. And every night, it's the last thing I look at. And there's huge amounts of data on this device about my customers, about my employees. So security is the key enabler. I know people generally think of security as a, a blocker or an inhibitor to data. I think it is the key enabler right now. If, if we can crack the code on giving people safe, secure access to data when, where, how they need it at the right moment when they need it, then it becomes the foremost enabler to being able to do our jobs in a more data-driven, data-centric way. So I'll cede my time to the experts on data security. <laughs> Yael, I, I know you've got things to add here. Yeah, I think that you're right about security and I also see it as the enablement uh, versus the blocker. Uh, but, but it, so we have security from one hand, the other hand is compliance. So uh, we have so much data, we need to control it and make sure that the right data is being uh, handled by the right pe people and the right people have access to it. So I think, you know, when you have so such a separate uh, team that sits in different places and have access to different places, it's also put a lot of challenges on uh, yeah. compliance. Together with that, that compliance, you know, matter, matter more and customers can today control the, you know, the data we can, uh, uh, as vendors, you know, use and, and, and see. So that's also uh, in addition to that. But from my perspective, I think that the remote work uh, affected a lot. The personal um, uh, uh, you know, feeling of, of the single uh, employee that we have. So I can't jump, you know, when sitting at home, I can't just jump to the next office, ask the data analyst uh, about the specific column and how it's being calculated. So it's right. also from the matter of, you know, how we work. Uh, and uh, if we have question about uh, data or we want to check something or, or do something, we can no longer just, you know, ask someone from uh, the other side of the table or go to someone. 
Uh, and that's require a lot of uh, all of the data to be centralized and easy to access. Uh, and also, I think one of the changes is that we, we want more people to be more independent around data. So to be able to find, you know, even the, you know, the, the, the restriction or the guidelines that the data governance uh, applies, but also, you know, where's the data and how to, to use it. And if I use it, what, where, it's, where it's coming from. So all of this uh, really require a documentation and a centralized uh, views and, uh, and tools to work to get together. And I think that's a, a big effect that uh, also uh, our solutions uh, need to go through. Great, thanks. Uh, Michael, do you have any thoughts on how data governance is related to creating business value? Yeah, th thanks, Emma. I sure. do, but before, uh, Yao just reminded me of one joke, if you, if you guys know it. Who is driving your digital transformation? Is it CDO? Is it CEO? No, it's COVID, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which is true, right? Good one. Everything yeah. that we are discussing yeah. here is in the heart of the digital transformation. Like, only it's it got much more faster. No, <clears throat> I wanted to mention what uh, Bailaiji and, and Bar uh, kind of uh, alluded to. Um, like the data governance and, and also data quality and to some extent also privacy, right? These disciplines were and to big extent still are seen as something kind of external, something limiting the people that needs to achieve something. But it doesn't have to be like this, right? You can, you can uh, almost uh, have it, you know, melt in the background and all of a sudden people will be uh, creating the business value and they'll be doing it with the right data, with the high quality data, with the, the privacy insured <clears throat> assured and they won't uh, see it as limitation they might actually not even notice it but all of a sudden they'll be they'll be working with with better data in general sense great thanks michael now staying with you michael uh, i had a question um about data quality and what is the relationship between data quality and data governance and do you see that relationship changing in the current era um <clears throat> I, I don't know if I would say it's um, it's changing kind of qualitatively. There is some some kind of a huge jump. I, I've always seen it as some continuum that uh, to us, data quality was also always to some extent part of the broader uh, term data governance. But if you think about, <clears throat> let's say, the, the ownership, the policies, etc., I think it's very tightly, tightly related. Starting with, of course, the metadata on top of the metadata, you need to have all this governance metadata, right? And as part of it, you want to also have uh, the quality information on each uh, and every single individual data asset, which then leads to what I was just talking about. Then it allows you to really automate uh, everything related to quality governance so that the people, the data engineers, the data citizens, they can simply focus on what they want to achieve. They don't. They don't need to worry about, you know, am I doing the right thing in terms of governance? Am I allowed to work with this data set, or am I am I working with the right um, quality, like uh, the best quality instance of the data? Because you have many instances, right, across organizations. Great, thanks, Michael. Um, so next up, Bar, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, same, same question relating to data quality and the relationship between data quality and data governance and how that's changing in the uh, the era of remote work. Yeah, I'll start by saying that I think like, we need to do some sort of makeover for these. Generally, they just they get a bad rep, like data governance, data quality. They're like, oh, it's like, like that boring topic no, no one wants to talk about. I vehemently disagree, and I'm pretty sure folks on this call disagree as well. I think it's perhaps the most interesting topic to talk about. Um, uh, I, honestly, like I do think that um, it's something that's been around for a couple of decades, right? Um, it, it's not a new problem, but I think there's a new urgency around that, um, which is related in large part to COVID um, and, and other things that are happening in the market. Um, but I do think it's becoming front and center today. So while it has been a problem for a long time, there's something about this moment, these last couple of years, that's making it a lot more important. And I also think that there are innovations in the last couple of years that are allowing us to take a radically different approach to addressing data quality and data governance. Um, I think historically, us vendors have really thought about these problems in silos. So we would have um, a lot of the problems completely separate. Um, and as data con consumers or data buyers, 
oftentimes customers have to actually like do a lot of hard work to figure out how do I piece together my data governance strategy um, and who should I work with for what? Um, and that is a very difficult uh, environment to operate uh, in as a customer. It's very challenging. I'll add to that, that there's so many new players in the space now. So as a customer, I was very confused. Um, and I know my customers are confused too. And so I think we have a responsibility as vendors to actually help clarify that. Um, and for me, the answer to that comes from asking a simple question of what is the problem that we're trying to solve? Um, and the problem that we're trying to solve may actually overlap and cross across those uh, different um, uh, silos. So for example, at Monte Carlo, we think about we talked about data trust and data observability. I actually think the solution to a lot of those cuts across data governance and data quality and data lineage um, and other things that actually the power is in bringing them together. Um, and I think we're seeing a lot more sort of solutions that are oriented around, um, around that, but it's early days. Sorry, go ahead, Emma. Oh, sorry, I was just agreeing with you, so I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Susan, please, yes. I just wanted to pile on to something that Bar just said, and it really comes down to trust. So all of us have to make decisions every single day, and we will not trust in that data if we believe or have any concerns whatsoever in the quality of that data. Therefore, you cannot have data governance without data quality. So those two things are inextricably linked. And Bar, I totally agree with you. Right now, this space of data, data management, data governance, data ops, data, data, data is so hot that there are new entrants into this marketplace all the time. Uh, it's a very fragmented space in the enterprise software. And, and right now, I, I feel like everybody has to have a strategy to be Switzerland, just to kind of be as open as possible because you know we don't know who's going to ultimately win this war in in enterprise data governance data management etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think right now we're all striving to help our customers have trust in their data and balaji i know that is something you've mentioned repeatedly trust and that's security, it, it, it's everything. So uh, I, I know you're going to probably add even more content to that. Balaji, are you going to add to this? Because uh, you have mentioned well, trust well, and I, I, quality. I completely agree with what Bar and, and Susan are saying. Like his, um, there is an aspect of building trust that quality brings to the table um, where if you don't trust the data, do you want to use it? And the problem is explodes if you're if you're a small group you can live with some of those things but as as data explosion has grown and democratization has grown in it is becoming a real challenge to build that and and security privacy builds on top of that and you we were asking a question of hey does is security is is it is checkbox or is this an enable right part of it but what we're seeing most forward-looking organizations doing that if you Think about governance in general, but those steps from metadata, quality, lineage into security compliance early on, you're building a trusted environment, which helps being an enabler in the first place. You actually end up having more data and more users into that platform because you have thought through these topics in advance. So what has changed over the last two years is these topics were somewhat done ad hoc and afterthought in some cases is now becoming prominent. And as vendors, I think the, the service we can do to these customers is education, right? So the, the industry understands the problem. They don't know how to go from point A to point B. And, and if you're consistently saying that about these are the fundamental steps and governance you need to do, you need to think about quality, you need to think about lineage, you need to think about others. Here's how you can put it together in a very crisp way. I think we have a real opportunity to level set and bring this adoption into everything. Great, thanks. Ah, Michael, you have something to add? You're on mute, Michael. We knew this would happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone, <laughs> someone had to, someone, we saw this coming. Someone had to be first, right? <laughs> uh, so I was going to say, I, I do agree with Bar that, uh, you know, we are, in business where we are excited about the data quality, data governance, uh, data privacy, et cetera. 
at the same time, um, the, the people we are serving at the end of the day, they just want to find the right data. They want to trust the data and they want to create value, right? So <clears throat> in a sense, our kind of perspective is that this all should be part of a data management, right? You are trying to get access to the data. You're trying to integrate it. Maybe you're trying to improve it somehow. And the, the you you don't want to worry about the quality and, and governance and, and privacy, right? You just want to go and do your job. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, Al, we haven't heard from you on this topic. Yes, um, going back on, you know, to talk about the relation between uh, data governance and, and data equality. So I think, you know, data governance increases the transparency into systems and processes. Uh, and that's allow, allow us to, to do a better uh, quality and to have a better understanding uh, of the system. So I think, you know, uh, there, there were always data quality problems and issues. And as you said, no one want to deal with it, but they are there. And I think that the data governance that is being evolved and advanced allow us to do a much better data quality work and help. And, that, and, and, that, and it also help, help it not being a, a problem and something that we hate doing because we have much better tools today and we have visibility and we can you know, improve that with, with good tools. So I think that the frustration of the teams are, will go and, and dramatically reduced uh, going forward. Uh, I, I super agree uh, about the trust building, uh, but also um, we, we are we have better tools and, and ways to be more proactive uh, around data quality um, issues, uh, and and with the data governance tool to bring more uh, matrices and thresholds and alerting uh, on on problems, uh, and that's you know what data governance is about. So. Uh, those two are super re related, and I think that together uh, we will get to uh, to the point where, uh, as Bar mentioned, you know, it's fun to do with with data, and we trust it, and we, you know, get the uh, innovation out of it, and 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 you know, things out of it. So we are on a good uh, path, I think. Great, thank you. So the next question I'm going to ask of each of you is what do you believe stands out as the greatest benefit of data governance right now? And the way I see it is that when you get the data governance right and you can trust the data, that democratization of the data is huge, right? So enabling everybody who's making a decision for the business to make the best decision possible by providing them with access to all of the data that they need to make that decision um, is huge. And uh, and that's something that you know we're focused on is, is building out a platform uh, that enables that. Um, but if we start with you, Susan, what do you believe is the greatest benefit of data governance right now? Access. Access. Um so I think that the biggest inhibitor to free, unfettered, frictionless access to data has been this notion of, is it safe? So if we can make data safe, secure, governed, so that uh, whoever is consuming that data, whether that be a human being, an executive, a customer, a vendor, an ML algorithm, uh, as long as that consumer of the data can believe, have faith and trust that the data that they're using, they can, they can trust it, then, then we have eliminated the biggest concern or the biggest blocker in using data to make better decisions and to make lives better. Uh, Emma, you're in the healthcare business. I mean, ultimately data should be saving lives. Uh, it should be uh, making sure that, that people can uh, start new businesses, uh, that we can uh, identify crime before it happens. You know, there, there's all of these amazing applications of data that we have not been able to fully realize because we just can't crack the code on giving unfettered, un, uh, frictionless access to data. So if we can automate and make eliminate human intervention out of this thing we call data governance, uh, every uh, big dream we have that data can fulfill can actually come to fruition. So I, I know that sounds like motherhood and apple pie, but I think we're all in the data business because we believe 
that data can solve some of the world's biggest challenges. And we just have to make it available. Great, thanks, Susan. We actually recently played a part in uh, in working with the uh, University of Oxford's Clinical Trial Services Unit uh, on the work that they did around the AstraZeneca uh, trial for the COVID vaccine. Uh, and it's, I mean, it's life altering, right? And once we got our vaccines, we're able to leave our homes and feel a lot safer. So yeah, I, I think it's huge. Uh, so Michael, over to you. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? The, well, so the, the question is, what do you think stands out as the greatest benefit of data governance right now? Uh, there isn't much to add to the brilliant you know, speech by Susan, but uh, <laughs> the, uh, the transformation, right? Digital or whatever we call it. It is about many things, but to a big extent, it is about uh, being able to let people act on, on their own, right? Uh, delegating many things. And unless we have the right way of doing governance in place, which is not papers, and it's not even papers in your intranet, right? It really needs to be automated. With this right way of governance, doing data governance, it actually unlocks you know, innovation initiative. People get motivated. In short, it's empowering people, which we all know that like empowered individual or team will perform whatever, 10 times, 100 times more than someone who is just told what to do. So I would say it unlocks empowerment. Great, thanks, Michael. Yeah, Al, what do you think? Yeah, I was just saying that Michael and Susan took, uh, <laughs> you know, I think already covered the, the the main topics that I was I thought about. I think independence and the second thing I thought, you know, is innovation, because eventually, you know, what we need data for is first for you know our day to day decision, uh, and we all want to be data driven. Uh, and to take our decision based on data. So for that, we need to be, uh, to trust the data and we have, need to have the access for it. And I think that today, every uh, employee, every person need the data to work with. So it's not something that only specific uh, teams in, in the company does. Everyone needs it. Everyone need access to it um, in a very efficient way. And I think that the, the next stream of companies is innovation, and I think it's being I, I heard it I, I heard it a lot recently that what company suffers uh, the first thing to be to be heard when you don't have a good data management uh, is innovation and the, and and the opportunity to 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 have insights from your data and to take it to one step ahead because you're always working on the basics and uh, assuring uh, that your processes uh, work well and that you know the data is there and it's organized but we actually want to take it to the next level and dream with it and build great stuff great thanks yael so bar what do you think stands out as the greatest benefit of data governance yeah i mean just hearing these folks i'm reminded um you know just when the the pandemic hit um the first role that the cdc was looking to hire was actually a chief data officer um it's the first thing that that was posted and I thought that was so powerful because to, to your point, um, there was sort of a strong realization that we have to turn to data. Um, and, and I agree um, that you know, we're not seeing the full realization of data quite yet in all of our sort of these areas, right? In, in health and um, uh, in, in law and, and um, policy and, and uh, many other areas. Um, I will say we're agreeing a lot on this panel. So, you know, at, at the risk of sounding controversial, um, I'll take a controversial stand and stand and, and say that I think that data governance in its current form is dead, actually. Um, and I think we we uh, we do have, given the new world, we have to rethink what data gov governance actually is. And I think that a lot of sort of the the path forward there is actually sort of turning to sort of discrete um, discrete problems that customers have that make up a strong data governance strategy or what was used to be a strong data governance strategy, and that comes down to strong data security and strong data uh, uh, discovery and, and many other areas. Um, and I actually think that the path forward from there um, is related to something that I'm seeing more and more data organizations do, which is think about data as a product and actually deliver data products. And that's something that I'm seeing so much more often. And that actually makes it a lot easier to think about, okay, if I have a team, very practically, that's building a particular data product, what do they need? 
They need to know that the data that they have is secure, that only the right folks have permission to the data that they need. They need to be able to discover the data so they know what data set to use and which one not to use. Um, they need to be able to trust the data. So they need to know that what they're using is actually the right and accurate data set. It's been refreshed. It's been um, uh, vetted. It's been, all of it has been transformed. Um, and so I think uh, we're, we're seeing a lot, a lot more of that happening, and and I'm excited about that next innovation. To TL's point, you know, I think we're we sort of at the beginning of that, um, and I'm reminded of this uh, sentence that DJ Patil, actually the first chief data scientist um, in the United States, uh, said a couple of weeks ago, is that you know the data scientists of the future are now in school, uh, and that's what we're looking forward to, right? So so it's a lot of it is ahead of us. Um, and if anyone has other controversial statements and wants to join the controversial band, is, is really <laughs> Michael I, looks like he's ready to be controversial. <laughs> I, I do, but I don't know if Balaji wanted to go first. Go ahead, Michael. No worries. No, uh, it wasn't actually, but it wasn't controversial to, towards what you said. But this this uh, panel is is part of a business intelligence uh, series, or I, I don't know exactly. <laughs> but uh, I actually think, at least for our customers. The, the decision making um, use or use cases, right, are on, on a decline. Like most of our customers, and we, we, are, we are a little bit more in data management probably than the rest of you guys here, right? We are actually providing the data as well, right? But most of it goes to other applications, systems, machines, algorithms, right? So the, the data product that Bar just mentioned is actually kind of a real thing. We are providing data through, of course, APIs. Uh, we are, or of course, there is still some um, some part of uh, the, the the consuming parts, which which are you know your Power BI's or Tableau's, your your uh, data science, right? But a lot of it actually is feeding data to yet another whatever mortgage self care app or multi channel app, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's uh, what I'm trying to say. Controversial is. It's no longer about BI. <laughs> right. Thanks, Michael. Okay, Balaji, can you give us a real-world example to qualify the benefits of data governance? Yeah, I think um, I think this is where I think we as an industry can always do better is when we go in and talk to our customers. How do you you say enablers and and all of these good words? But how do you, what does it mean? Right? What is what does it really mean? I think the example I always take is like hey, we were talking to a a customer, a consumer products company, and, and the challenge they had was the data explosion was real. Like every part of the organization is trying to go and say, I need access to the data. And they were coming in with saying, hey, I want access to this data. And and but the legal security team say, hey, wait a minute, like you, you just can't access anything. You have to go and make sure there's not any sensitive data or privacy data or compliance data or legal contracts need to so there was a team which was actually manually reviewing every request and it would take them weeks to do that part, right? So, and so what are the people are hungry for data, but they're waiting for weeks to get access to it because somebody has to go and manually review, vet it out, approve and, and other portions of it. And, and that simple process of automation, we helped them with saying, hey, let's centralize all of this. Just put these requests in one place and we'll automate that part took them from what used to be disparate manual work to do it in hours. And, and that really helped, A, cut down the time A, is waiting to get access to the data. But two, you know, it built a culture in the organization saying, hey, this is doable. Like we can also participate in this process and it helps in the data democracy part of it. So I think there are real world examples of governance of building quality or, or metadata and lineage and reducing that friction. Uh, in the dem access of democratization part of it, as some of you have pointed out, can be actually quantified. And it can be, we can help our customers champion this internally. Saying it's not just a checkbox, right? It's not a fancy word of enabler. There is real world ROI on it. And, and it means dollars. You save money and you, know, you, you can actually do things faster. So in our example, what used to take them weeks, they do hours, they're able to onboard more data, more users. And so even in the midst of COVID, when they shifted the strategy, they were able to get to that point fairly quickly than historically they would have. And it all helps in the end goal of doing better with data, but how can you do it more responsibly? So I think there are real world examples we are seeing of being this quantifying this enabler. And if we can make it simple, if we can make the ROI easy to understand, uh, 
customers will adopt this, right? So, and, and, and I think that's where, I think as an industry, we can do better. Thanks, Balaji. Oh, great. So we've got some input here from Spencer. Excellent discussion, and I agree. And I agree with all the points from each of the panelists. Personally, in a nutshell, I believe data governance's greatest benefit is insisting in improving the capabilities of decision making by data. Totally agree with you. That was the point I was trying to make inelegantly up front. Great. Thanks for the contribution, Spencer. Yeah, I'll just comment on that. I think it's super interesting thinking about the capability of decision making. Um, it's actually really interesting because I think folks are starting to measure that. Um, so specifically two measurements that I'm starting to see folks measure. One is um, time to insight. So obviously, like there's a big gap between having the data and actually being able to answer a question. Um, and so for a given analyst or a given data scientist, what what is that time uh, and can you reduce that? Um, and then the second interesting measurement that I'm seeing more and more teams look at is percentage of decisions made in a company based on data. Uh, which is very hard to measure, but I actually think is a very compelling idea. Like literally, you know, um, uh, across the across the company, how many decisions are we making about our product strategy, about our sales go to market strategy, about um, you know which customers to speak to and when? What percentage of that is actually based on data? Um, and sort of begs the question of like what percentage of that should be based on data, right? There's certainly some questions that should not be, in, in my opinion, uh, do, you know, we end up relying sort of on, on our gut and, and oftentimes there just isn't enough data. Um, but generally, um, yeah, which I'm sure you all are familiar with, um, but generally, like I think our ability to get more sophisticated in measuring that is a really, really interesting first next step and being able to measure whether data governance is actually adding value to our lives at all. Um, and this is perhaps the one area where we can tangibly say, yes, we are we are better as a company. We're able to move faster in the market. We're able to uh, make decisions that we wouldn't have been able before um, uh, thanks to the data governance or some version of it. Right, better decisions based on the data. Agreed. Uh, Michael, you look a little perplexed. Are you okay? <laughs> You're on mute again, Michael. <gasps> Thank you. To me, to me, the narrowing it down to decision making is uh, is just kind of I don't want to say wrong, but it's it's just not enough, right? Um, there is so much um, value innovation coming out of the uh, internal data product, right? You have you have the raw data somewhere. You have your catalog to access the data, and then you have someone who is. Uh, about to create a new version of the product, or as I said, right, new 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 self-care mobile app, or or modify the app, or something. And in the old days, you would have to go through, you know, uh, planning a project, getting an integration team on board, taking care of all the governance and quality, etc. In in the worst case, via talking to the people responsible, they handing you the papers or whatnot, finding out who's responsible. But at the end of the day, the, the important thing was the data product, which was then used to create value. And the value doesn't have to be someone looking at a report and making a decision on where to add resources. It can simply be directly related to the new creation of something, new innovation. So that's why I'm kind of um, opposed to the notion it is all about BI. It's not. Thanks, Michael. Susan, you've been nodding sagely. Do you have something to add to what Michael said? <laughs> Thank you for calling me sage. <laughs> um, I too just went up. Um, wow. you know, uh, Michael and Barr have both alluded to this notion that data itself is the product. And, and in my introduction, I believe data is a product. It is this gold that we are trying to get to. And it has its own supply chain. It has its own discipline. And that was kind of our reason for founding Zaloni was to have a single pane of glass to manage that supply chain of data. But to, also to Michael's point, the consumers of data are no longer solely a human being through a, a dashboard or a report, more often than not, the consumers of data are a customer, a vendor, or a process, or an algorithm, or an application, or an API. Um, you think about one of our customers is a mutual fund company, and they are creating products 
of ESG stocks. So environmentally, socially governed, you know, more socially aware, better, more responsible companies. So they are creating scores of, of stocks to build these more modern, socially responsible investment products. Well, that data is not feeding a human. It's not feeding a dashboard. It's feeding a scoring engine. And that is what we're seeing more and more that these data products are, are feeding other things to make the world a better place, quite honestly. So um, that, that's what I wanted to add to Michael. I totally agree to his hypothesis there. Great, thanks, Susan. So Susan, we're gonna start with you for the next question, which is what is the best piece of advice you can offer when evaluating data management and governance vendors and solutions? Yeah, two things. Um, the first is it's complex. I think Barr put herself in the shoes of many of our customers. This space has a lot of products, a lot of new technologies, your old legacy on-prem environment versus your new cloud environment, whole new ball game. Um, so there's many products. So my first piece of advice is don't go shopping for a product for every single uh, bit of this data supply chain, because guess what? You're gonna spend all of your time trying to piece all of these disparate technologies together and you're not going to get to the value that Balaji was just referencing. Um, so simplify, simplify, simplify. And then the second thing is, just be careful of painting yourself into a corner. So a lot of the mega vendors, um, and we partner with all of them, so this is no disrespect to AWS or Microsoft or Oracle or SAP or Salesforce or anybody, but be careful of painting yourself into a corner that it is a solution that only works in one cloud environment, or it is a solution that only works uh, with one application vendor. Um, make sure you keep your options open. Again, I think the right philosophy is to kind of be Switzerland and to be possible to whatever happens in this space, because it's gonna change. This is, I mean, data is really cool and sexy and fun right now. Um, there's so much innovation going on. There's so much money and capital being poured into this. Um, take advantage of the innovation and keep your options open. Great, thanks, Susan. Yeah, same question for you. What advice would you provide? Yes, so um, I, I do think that, you know, when, when validating something, of course you need to, to make sure that uh, your daily use cases uh, apply on it and try to take specific internal organization need and make sure you get the value. So sometimes I see I, I know the customers are trying to get it all or trying to, you know, to, to win and to uh, put the new uh, uh, a tool or vendor to solve everything. But I think it works better when you try to solve one thing in a very successful way and to validate that you get a value and only then expand to more use cases. Also, I think that automation, I mean, we are trying to bring in a, tools and, uh, and and solutions that won't be an asset, that, that will be an asset, sorry, won't be a liability. And, and what helps for that is, of course, automation. We want to reduce the manpower that is needed to uh, work with tools. And we want to make sure that it doesn't require too much professional services, uh, supporting uh, something that can run uh, within uh, uh, you know your system and work for you and not you working for the the tool yeah good point i mean data operations are 24 7 business right and having to staff it with knowledgeable people 24 7 365 yeah. can become very expensive uh like susan said earlier about being the switzerland that's the way we're uh working here we want to work we're building our own data quality solutions data integration data governance and so on uh, but we need to be able to work with all of the vendors because we are all solving different problems everybody's Issues are slightly different and being able to work with different vendors, I think, is, is hugely important. Uh, Balaji, you had some advice that you wanted to provide here. Well, I think this, uh, <clears throat> Susan and Ale and, and you have covered it very, very well, and is that uh, data governance is a very wide topic and I think everybody understand needs to be done, but I think it's a journey and it's not a specific point in time. I think what organizations, if we can simplify as vendors for, what does the governance journey looks like? And really, like Al pointed out, so 
is is really looking at what is the first or few things that you want to really solve, which is really identifying those friction points and in your organization and saying, is that metadata, is it quality, is a lineage, is a security, what 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 is the big bang for the buck here? And and doing that, but also putting together a program that is aligns with your long-term strategy. So this is not a point in time. This may take you to like a year or two year worth of journey and very variety of steps. But if you're able to go and prove out the first step and create value, people understand it, and then you can build up on top of it. But it also doesn't mean you just look in today. You also have to look three, five years down the line and saying, what is your data strategy? And what are the steps you need to build in and when they can come in? And if you do that, you can implement a program. So simplify, as Susan said, pick a, a initial use case that Ail said is all I would agree as well. Great, thanks. Okay, so for uh, for my final question, uh, I think we're going to start with you, Bar. This time is um, how does one sell the return on investment of data governance tooling to the C-suite and and to the board? So if there was an elevator pitch that you have uh, for selling uh, ROI for data governance tooling, let's hear it. Yeah, I think you know the way to answer that is similar to sort of the, the the questions that we had earlier today. Like, put yourself in the shoes of that person, um, what, you know, whoever that person is, and ask yourself, what does that person care about, and how does this initiative that I'm working on promote that person's initiative? And if it doesn't, maybe you shouldn't be doing it. Uh, you know, we all we, we all are very busy people, and there's a lot of different things that we could be working on. And if we're working on a specific data governance initiative, we have to believe that it's at the end of the day promoting the bottom line that um, the company cares about. Um, and so, more than anything, I think it's tying that um, direct uh, line between the activities that we're working on and how that's promoting. Um, uh, sort of the, the company strategy overall. And to me, that the company strategy always comes back to making it easier or making it making the lives of our customers better. And so if you can actually show that by improving the use of our data with a strong data governance solution, you can actually improve the lives of your customers. Um, that is sort of a slam dunk um, uh, for me. So for example, um, you know, if you are working on, on a product that has sort of a personalized recommendation, if you can do a better job of actually surfacing the right information to those consumers um, and create a better experience for those folks, then um, obviously that sort of improves the outcomes for, for the person that you're trying to, to sell this idea. But more importantly, it creates a better experience for the customer. Um, and I think at the end of the day, that's that's why we're all here for and that's what we need to, to come back to. Um, I will add that, you know, the only other thing to think about and, um, uh, you know, I think this ties back to also the question that you had before in terms of, you know, what advice do we have? Um, I oftentimes when sort of, you know, when I try to sell something internally or any advice that I have, I actually turn to our values, um, our values as a company and use them as a guiding light uh, for how to make decisions. Um, and so my advice would be, you know, work with um Work with companies and people that share your values, and and I think more today more than ever, a lot of the decisions are made are made based on that. So scrutinize heavily what are the values for your company, um, and if this is a data governance initiative, how does that promote values um, uh, within your company? I think there's you know there isn't a more important time to to lean into that, and I think people are um, people are in search of that. Um, so uh, yeah. I think being values first can go a long way for all of us. Okay, great. So, uh, Michael, uh, how do you think we should um, sell the ROI on data governance tooling to the to the C suite? Is it you know, regulatory compliance not, not, requirements? Has everybody terrified of big fines? Is that how you not, sell it? Not, not the ROI question again. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, it, it it is not easy, but uh, I would go back to what. Most of us mentioned at some point, I think what, what we are doing is we are helping people and organizations to be able to innovate, to bring value to the world, right? It's Of course, it's about values as in kind of culture, right? But uh, I think at the end of the day, it is really about uh, us helping to use data to create new wonderful things innovate uh, etc and it can be you know product but it can be uh, new drugs or uh, anything right it doesn't it can be it can be improving life of uh, of citizens right there is a lot of room in in governments right 
So I think every single um, customer, every single organization, every individual, it can be about individual, you know, coming up with a new startup idea. It needs to be specific. And yes, it can also include, you have this heavy regulation and unless you deal with it, you are not able to, you know, proceed with your idea because it just wouldn't work. But I think it really needs to be very specific to each individual uh, situation. And what we do, we focus on really innovating, creating, creating more value. Great, thanks. Susan, do you have something to add? I, I would just uh, echo everything that everybody has said. I believe that the primary interest of the C-suite, whether it's my company or it's Bank of America or Apple, I, I think most executives want to fully enable to their employees to do the best work they can. And I think all of us passionately agree that a key enabler of that is to be able to use data to do their jobs to the best of their ability. And the main ROI of data governance is uh, eliminating friction in people getting access to that data to do their jobs. And if you eliminate that friction, you save time, you save money, and you keep yourself off the front page of the Wall Street Journal. And I, I mentioned that one the last because I think a lot of people try to sell data governance as a way to eliminate data breaches. I, I don't think that's what we should lead with. I think we should lead with speed, responsiveness, uh, getting, uh, making people more productive versus the fear factor. Great. Thanks, Susan. Hi, everybody. I wanted to uh, jump back in here towards the end of our uh, panel and wrap things up and finally give each and every one of you an opportunity to share some final thoughts or just to promote your product, um, however you'd like to do that. Um, Emma, we'll start with you. Uh, what would you like to tell the audience? Yeah, so I learned a lot today. So thanks, everybody. So a, a great discussion. Uh, so, so thank you for that. Um, for me, a uh, big believer in the democratization of decision making. And uh, to make good decisions, you need access to good quality data. We're building out a platform that enables that. And uh, we have a, a free trial version of that available on our website. Uh, so if you want to visit actian.com, you can try it for yourself. Excellent. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, Susan, how about you? So thank you, Solutions Review, John, well done. And Emma, great job. Uh, <laughs> what a fantastic moderator you were today. Um, so it it's was a an honor job. to be here. Um, <laughs> if, uh, if we can help you uh, optimize, automate the supply chain for your data, uh, come talk to us at Zaloni. We would love to help you. OK, Michael, how about you? Unmuted. Um, so we, we um, as I mentioned, we are in the business of providing high quality governed data to, you know, the people making decisions, but also to people using the internal data products to create value. For that, we have a platform which um, is based on the concept of data fabric or data mesh. Now there's this big discussion, data fabric. And uh, we believe this is a way forward there is basically no other way how to let people use the data in a frictionless way. Excellent. Thank you. Yael, what about you? Uh, first, uh, thank you, John and Emma, um, for hosting this great panel. Um, so we are helping um, uh, customers uh, viewing their data and tracing the data. So if you'd like to see how the data is being uh, flow within your organization and in few hours set up a, a visualization that allow you to see every column and every asset where it's being uh, uh, spread in the in the environment and where it's originally coming from and a lot more of that so this is something uh, that we are doing and we are helping customer do migrations and helping also a day-to-day -day questions and shortening a lot every analysis and every root cause analysis um, understanding where the data is. So we would be happy to help you trust your data and see it. Um, and a lot more than that in Octopi. I finished, I can let the, maybe Bar continue. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I was on mute. It gets everybody. Um, <laughs> appreciate that. Uh, Bar, how about you? Yeah, um, I'll actually pitch uh, data observability and not so much Monte Carlo. Um, so, you know, just to take a step back for a second, something that all of you all probably felt uh, waking up in the morning and get a flood of emails or calls about why the data is wrong. Um, you or your team probably spending a good percentage of your time actually like running around, uh, spending time on fire drills. If you're experiencing any of that, we call that data downtime, periods of time when your data is wrong or inaccurate or just erroneous. Um, it's a problem that's plaguing our industry and there is actually a better way to solve it. We borrow concepts or think that we should borrow concepts from software engineering. So in DevOps, there's a very well understood concept um, called observability. Um, and the category of data observability is taking all those best practices from software engineering and bringing that to data. Um, and so, you know, while software engineering teams have amazing solutions like PagerDuty and AppDynamics and New Relic and Datadog, data teams are flying blind. Um, and I think we have to correct that. Um, and so, you know, with that, I wish everyone here a lot less data downtime, a lot more um, sleep at night. Absolutely. Uh, last but not least, Balaji. All right, I'll have the final word. So first of all, thank you guys. Um, it's, it's an honor to be in, in the esteemed panel and appreciate the opportunity. It was great listening to all of you. Um, Private Sarah, we are at the mission of helping enterprises leverage data responsibility. So we help enterprise balance data democratization with the need for adhering to compliance, security, and privacy mandates. And we do that by providing a platform that helps them A, get visibility on what data they have, especially sensitive data, and to giving them one place where they can go and manage rules and access rules around who can access to what data to make sure that right people have access to right data and three giving them visibility on who's doing what and help them do that we believe in being the enabler by doing this right we can actually democratize data give more access to the data and truly help enterprises in our mission which is leverage data but do it responsibly well said. Um, and with that, I would like to thank our entire group of panelists for their time and you for your attention. If you came in late or missed any portion of this discussion, you can rewatch the entire broadcast anytime at youtube.com slash solutions review. And please stay tuned to all of our social channels for ongoing discussion and coverage of the third annual Insight Jam, including our next roundtable panel, which starts in about one hour, 3 p.m. Eastern, on the evolution of BI and data analytics software. It should be a good chat. One more time, just a final wave. Thank you again for watching. Thank you to our panelists and have a great afternoon. Thank you, everybody.